We are FBC Summit, leading everyday people to love Jesus and make Him known. Thank you so much for joining us today. Here's our pastor, Dr. Larry LeBlanc. Psalm 34 this morning, you're going to see this morning that we just sang directly from Scripture. In fact, sometimes there is a discussion we, we sang, talked about this morning that he's put a new song in our mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. We say we want to sing a new song. And often we talk about whether or not we're going to sing new songs or whether we're going to sing old songs. I want you to know that the song you just sang is older than any song that's in your hymn book. There is not a song in your hymn book that is older than the song that you just sang. And the reason for that is it comes directly from the Scripture that we're going to be walking through this morning. In fact, I hope that you'll highlight Psalm 34. I hope as we walk through this together, as you just sang it together, that this will be a triumphant song of testimony, a triumphant song of praise for you that you will continually go back to so that we can collectively come magnify, come exalt the Lord together, and that we would taste and see that the Lord is good. I want to know this morning, if you were asked, now I realize that, that speaking in large public settings is not necessarily for everyone. But let's say in a small group, or maybe even individually, just one-on-one, if someone were to ask you the question to tell you about your relationship with the Lord, if you were to tell someone else about your relationship with God, could you give your personal testimony about what God has done in your life? Could you give someone your salvation testimony? And then once you gave them your salvation testimony, could you continue with the testimony about the goodness of God, about how He's been good to you throughout your life? Now, we're not going to do this this morning, but if I were to just say, okay, we're about to take a three-minute break, and I'm going to go sit in the choir loft, and right now, for the next three minutes, I want you to turn to the person sitting beside you, and in three minutes or less, I want you to give your testimony about how you came to know the Lord Jesus Christ and what He has done for you since that saving moment. Could you do it? Now, when we ask that question, sometimes people will begin to fumble a little bit. Well, well, well I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I mean I, I've done this. I've been there. I'm not asking you whether or not you're the greatest public speaker in the world. I'm asking you whether or not you could tell somebody to taste and see that the Lord is good and to be able to tell them about what He's done for you. You see, friends, when we come to talking about being able to talk about the declarations of God's goodness and what He's done, really the Psalms, that's what they are. They're a personal testimony of people who have been on mountaintops and on valleys low, and they know what it's, experienced to be, what it's like to experience everything in between. And as we turn to Psalm 34, again, as we're journeying through these psalms together, we see specifically in the superscription that we are told where this psalm came from. It tells us that it is a psalm of David when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech, who drove him away and he left. It's amazing that David even looks back on the times where some people might look at his life and say, this is one of the craziest things I've ever read. If you go back and read 1 Samuel 21, 10 through 15, David was brought before this king. Now, it's interesting that the superscription in 34 and what happened in 1 Samuel 21, some people have used that to say that the Bible contradicts itself. Some of you may have already flipped over to 1 Samuel 21, and you'll notice there's a different king's name. In Samuel 34, In Samuel 21, it says that he went insane before Achish. Yet, when you look at what we just looked at, Psalm 34, it says that he pretended to be insane before who? Abimelech. Well, those are two different names. So obviously, it's the same incident. The Bible must be wrong. So if the Bible's wrong in that, some people would argue the Bible must be wrong in everything. So how do we approach that with this apparent contradiction? Well, just a little bit of study, you see that there's no contradiction at all. Achish was the proper name of the king. Let me give you a real simple example. If you were to say, if someone were to walk up to me this morning when I walked in, and by the way, this happened, and I walked through the door and somebody said, hey, Larry, how are you this morning? I'd say, well, I'm doing fine. And then I walked past and the next person said, hey, pastor, are you doing okay this morning? And I said, yeah, I'm doing great. Now, which one of those had my name wrong? Neither one. Achish was the proper name. That was the man's name. Abimelech is not a proper name. Abimelech is a title. It's like calling someone Pharaoh or calling someone king. So the Abimelech 
was Achish. The Abimelech of the Philistines was Achish. So we see that in the psalm, and David pretends to be insane before him so that he would be cast out of his presence. And when God delivered David, even after he pretended to be insane, and David looks back at that deliverance and other deliverance, he decided to sing a new song. He decided to sing a song about who God was, and he wanted the whole world to see what God had done in and through his life. So what we're reading today is a personal testimony of how God's been good to him. And I pray today that maybe it will become some of your life song about what, how God has been good to you. Let's stand together and read this gorgeous psalm. Psalm 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt His name together. I sought the Lord and He answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to Him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all of his troubles. And the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Oh God, may we taste and see that you are good this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please be seated? So I'm going to lay out the big idea for you this morning that God hears and helps those who love Him and who call on Him. And we're going to see how David fleshes that out in the first 10 verses of Psalm 34 as we walk through this beautiful, beautiful song of praise together. But let's just begin how David begins because when he comes out with praise, he says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. Praise the Lord at all times. Let's get real. Has there ever been a time in your life where you really didn't feel like praising God? Sometimes you don't even feel like praying. Sometimes you know He's good, but you don't really want to tell Him He's good because He didn't do what you wanted Him to do and things didn't work out and the situation and circumstances aren't always there. Yet, David says that when I look at my life, I'm going to praise Him at all times. Now, someone ignorant of the Bible might simply say, well, that's great for David, but his life was always good. He, he, he was always doing well. He was always blessed beyond measure. He was always in great shape with his family. He never had issues. He never had sicknesses. He never had problems. He was never in trouble. Well, you hadn't read the Bible if you think that's David's story. David had one of the most tumultuous lives that you'll ever read about. He feared for his life multiple times over and over and over again. He lost the things that were most precious to him, including children. He had family strife that is unimaginable. He had issue after issue after issue. And so if you read the life of David in First and Second Samuel, you don't come away and say, boy, that David, he had everything together. He had it all. Everything was a bed of roses for him. No, you come away and say, man, that guy had some problems. And yet he says, verse 1, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will ever be on my lips. How many of you need to hear today that some of the best times to praise God is when you don't want to praise God? Sometimes the best time to lift up a thanksgiving to God is maybe your heart is not in it because of the situations, but you declare to yourself, you declare to the Lord, and you declare to those around you that my God is good all the time. He's good when I feel like it, and He's good when I'm not, when I'm not but I'm going to praise Him at all times. This is when He says, I had to pretend to be insane. The Bible says that He literally went before Abimelech and was slobbering at the mouth, pretending not even to be able to make functional words and sentences so that he would be driven out before the king and get a second chance. And even after that, he says, I've got to tell you that God is good. He has looked after me at my best point and he has been there with me in my worst times as well. Now, there are people that will tell you that's absolutely impossible. I've tried that and that just sounds like a bunch of power of positive thinking junk. 
I can't praise God when I don't feel good. I can't praise God when people have done me wrong. I can't praise God whenever there's issues in my family. I just can't do it. And if that's what you're saying today, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. But now you're saying, wait, hold on a minute. He just told us that that's what we're supposed to do. What's amazing about this is that grace allows us to do what human nature will not allow. Let me give you some biblical examples. One of my favorite examples in the Bible is when Paul and Silas, about midnight, they're singing in prison, and the guards are wondering, why are these guys singing? They're going to be killed. They're going to be chained. They're locked up, and all of a sudden the earthquake comes, and it busts them out, right? The angel of God comes, and he removes them from this prison sentence. Now, when you look back on that, if you were chained to a wall in prison awaiting death, you would say, how in the world would somebody be able to sing? How would they be able to praise God? And how would they be able to witness in a situation and a circumstance like that? Well, the reason is they know the God that delivered them before could deliver them again, but they also know whether He delivers or not. He's my God and He's been good to me. So they praised even in the midst of a situation where you wouldn't think someone would praise. What about old John? 90 years old, exiled to the island of Patmos, laying on a bed of lava rocks, seeing the greatest vision that was ever given to a man, and he praises the Lord when he joins with the host of heavens and sees the vision. You would think, well, if anybody wasn't going to praise, it would be somebody exiled to an island and left for dead, and yet he finds a reason in the midst of that to praise God. So we keep coming back and we keep coming back to salvation we keep coming back to what God's done for us it's why Job when everything was taken from him was able to say the Lord gives and the Lord takes away but what church blessed be the name of the Lord we can do that too and one of the reasons we can is look at verse 2 he says my soul will boast in the Lord let the afflicted hear and rejoice that's exactly what Paul said. If I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in Jesus. That I have something to boast about. We hear people that brag about everything under the sun, but when it really gets right down to it, you really only have one thing to brag about. You really only have one thing to boast about. And that is the fact that the Lord is your God. That's why you come and magnify the Lord with me. That's why we extol Him at all times. That's why we give Him grace, give Him praise, and thanksgiving we boast in the Lord. But He doesn't just say that He's going to do that I love this look at verse 3 and that's what we just sang come glorify the Lord with me verse 3 let us exalt his name together some people have tried to make light of the need for corporate worship but friends you need to understand that there is something about praising God with people let me I asked you to get real a minute ago and you may not even shake your head to give me a nod, but have you ever felt, just, just not felt like showing up at church? Some of you are like, how did he know? <laughs> I started not even to come this morning. I had someone tell me this week, this week, he said I had a week a couple of weeks ago and I had just decided that I wasn't going to church. It had been a bad week. I was tired. Just wanted to catch up. Thought I'd catch you later on. Maybe jump on Facebook and watch. And one of their children said, aren't we going to church? And so they got dressed and they showed up. And this was their testimony they said, from the moment I walked in and the music started, and then once you started the sermon, I thought, wow, I was supposed to be here. I needed to be here. Forget what I thought I wanted or thought I needed. I needed to come and praise God. I needed to magnify Him with other people. That's one of the reasons that so often in church I'll just start smiling. Because not only is it my job to remind you of how good God is, but guess what? It's your job to remind me of how good God is. It's our job together to come and extol Him and praise Him and be with the people of God and remind others that I 
have some things to praise God about, but guess what? I'm not the only one in this place. And when we come together to exalt Him and praise Him together, there's power in that. There's energy in that. The Holy Spirit is in that because where two or more gathered, there He is also. So come and magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt His name together and let this forever be a place of praise where when people think about being a part of First Baptist Summit, they would say, now there's a church that comes and magnifies the Lord together. There's power in it. There's power in it. And he gives now, in the next few verses, the reasons that we magnify him together. The reasons for this praise. The reason for this boast. The reasons for this exaltation. The reasons for this magnifying of the Lord. Look at, verses, look at verse 4. I sought the Lord and He answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Then in verse 6, This poor man called and the Lord heard him and He saved me from all my troubles. Number one, God answers our prayers and delivers us from fear. God answers our prayers and delivers us from fears. So let's talk specifically this morning about how He delivers us from fears. So, I want to just talk very briefly of what I believe that the three main fears that every human being has. And I'm not talking about being scared of spiders or, or snakes. I'm talking about legit fears. What are the fears that keep us up at night? What are those things that bring anxiety and worry to our heart? And there may be more than these, but, but I don't know that anyone doesn't deal with one of these three at some point in their life. Number one is fear of man. Fear of man. We are, you say, well, I'm not scared of people. The number one predominant fear that people have is the fear of other people. Whether, what somebody thinks of them, how somebody is going to treat them, how are they going to receive me if I act this way, if I stand on principle, how are people going to like that? We are a people who are known to fear men. We want people's respect. We want people's opinion. We want peer pressure. To, to, we want people to be, accept us and to love us and to like us and to think we're nice and to think we're attractive and to think we're funny and to think we're intelligent. We want people's approval. So because because we want people's approval, we fear the people that can't give us that approval. And what David says when he says that he removes our fears, he's saying he's taken away the fundamental fear of man. Because if I have the approval of God, if I fear God, then I don't have to fear man. And all of a sudden when I begin to fear God and I begin to place Him as my place of utmost awe and respect and worship, then the fear of men begins to subside. Why? Because I recognize that my main goal in my life is to please an audience of one. And if I please God, I don't have to worry about everybody else in my life. And by the way, you're not going to please them all. Look at me. You may please some people all the time, and you may please all of the people some of the time. Doubtful, but you might. But you are not going to please everybody all the time. That is a recipe for going insane if you think you can do that. So instead of worrying about every group and faction and individual, why don't you worry about one and please him? And he says, so he removes certainly the fear of man. But secondly, he removes the fear of circumstances and situations in our life. Financial problems, failure, loss, grief, sickness, getting old, all of those things. You say, how does the Lord remove those? Because we recognize I don't have to fear those things because I have a providential, I have a sovereign God who takes care of me, so I need not fear that. And then one of the greatest fears of mankind, maybe the greatest fear of mankind, and I would say this should be the biggest fear of mankind, and it's a fear that God will remove from your heart and He will do it immediately and he can do it today and that's the fear of death come in close and listen if you are not redeemed if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ if you've never believed on him that he died on Calvary's cross and rose again on the third day if you've never repented of your sin and asked him to take control of your life then you should be scared to death of dying But if you have, but if you have, then death went from enemy to friend. And he removes that fear from our life. He answers our prayers and deliver us, delivers us from fear. Number two, 
It says that God produces radiance in our lives. Look at verse 5. Those who look to Him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. What does it mean that our faces are radiant or that God produces radiance in our lives? All throughout Scripture, we understand that we are told to let our light shine before men. Isn't that what Jesus said? We let our light shine. What light shine? What is the light that is being referred to? It's the radiance that the psalmist is talking about here. And you see this this bit of radiance. Sometimes you can see it in in glimpses of people. Let me just give you a few examples of places that you've seen glimpses of this. If you've ever seen a young child just ecstatic or happy about something... You've seen a glimpse of radiance. If you've ever seen a young couple that is convinced that they are more in love than any two people that have ever met anyone in all their lives, you have seen a glimpse of that radiance. If you have ever looked into the face of someone who has just won a tremendous triumph or a victory, you've seen a glimpse of that. If you've ever been beside the bed of a dying saint, that had a peace because they knew what the next few moments held. You've seen a glimpse of that radiance. But what David knows, quite simply, is that it has been all the, throughout this psalm that he has been talking in the first person. Watch. He's been talking about I, my soul, I will extol the Lord. And then all of a sudden... He says, those who look to him are radiant, their faces are never covered with shame. He begins to talk about this now in the plural. And the reason for that is David is able to look back and recognize that it's not just him that's been inspired and been filled by this radiance. It was was throughout the ages and even until now, people have been filled with the radiance of God. So so how is someone filled with the radiance of God or the light of God? Number one, they turn away from the hindrances and entangling sin in their lives. Think about Abraham. He left his home and he came to the promised land and he turned away and he experienced that in his life. When you think about Joseph, when he turned from temptation, when he was in Potiphar's home, we're going to talk about that this week at Bible school. When you think about Moses as he stands, as he moves from Egypt's pleasures, being the prince of Egypt and he stands yet in front of this burning bush and he leads God's people. When you think about Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego when you think about Paul when he was left in his blindness because he saw this holy vision of the Lord Jesus Christ they turned away from their lives before. They turned away from what they had. They turned away from what they knew and they turned towards something else. You see friends, too often in the gospel all we've preached is that you need to move away from sin. You need to move away from sin. You need to move away from sin. But why would I ever move away from sin if I didn't know that what I was moving to was better than the sin I was in? And that's what so many people in this world are missing. They think that there's no way that the enjoyment of the pleasure of their sin could be matched. And how many of you ask if you could give a testimony? Is there anybody in God's house today that could stand up and say, I lived with what the world calls the pleasures of sin. I lived in sin. I lived in darkness. I lived in debauchery. I lived in gross habits and gross sexual immorality. I lived in that place. And the Lord, through His sovereign providence, looked down and He bestowed His grace on me. And I was radically saved by the power of the gospel. And I could and stand up right here and right now and tell you that walking with Jesus is so much better than walking in the pleasures of sin. That the joy of the abundance of Christ is better than the pleasures of this world. That's what it is to live in Christ and have the radiance of His glory because no longer are you bragging on your sin-filled condition and all the debauchery of your life. You're now bragging on the Redeemer who set your feet upon a rock and placed a new song in your mouth, a hymn of praise to your God. And oh friends, if you're you're lost, I can tell you, it's so much better walking with Jesus. It's so much better being redeemed by Jesus. It's so much better being forgiven by Jesus. It's so much better. Satan will lie to you, the flesh will lie to you, and the world will lie to you to tell you that somehow you're you're going to miss all of the fun and all of the enjoyment. And I want you to know that you're believing a lie because the greatest lives ever lived are people that live in the abundance of having the radiance of Christ emanate through their lives because they've been radically saved by the power of the gospel.
They turned away from hindrances and entangling sin. They sought God. They sought God. Moses on Sinai, he left Egypt. And while he was there on the mountain, we are told that he began to be transfigured and his face glowing a radiant white. So when he came down off of the mountain, everyone could tell that he had been with the Lord. And then it's not an accident when you jump to the New Testament and Jesus takes the disciples up on the mountain and on this Mount of Transfiguration, it was Moses and Elijah. But all of a sudden, the same Moses who had glowed with the glory of God disappears. And Elijah, he disappears as well. And they saw Jesus and He was glowing in, in radiant white light. And the reason was, was because as they looked at Him, they saw the glory of God was all around Him. You see, friends, that radiance is available to every single one of us. You say, well, why is it that people don't find it? This is really kind of simple. What did Jesus say? Seek me and you'll never be able to find me, right? Seek me and it'll be a mystery. Seek me and maybe you'll turn a corner and I'll be there. That's what Jesus said, right? Seek me and you will... So if people aren't finding Christ, why are they not finding Christ? Because they don't want to find Him. People are not finding Christ, not because Jesus is hiding, but because people really don't want Christ. They want the benefits of Christ. But they don't want Christ. And when you don't seek Christ, you don't find Christ. But I'm here to tell you today, there's someone wondering, I don't know if I can be saved. You can be saved. Seek Christ and you will find Him. He's not hiding from you. He's staring at you right in the midst of this sermon because the Gospel is free and the Gospel is clear and the Gospel is being presented. And if you feel right now that you need the Gospel, run! Don't walk towards the Lord Jesus Christ with the humble recognition that He has changed the lives of all these people and He can change yours as well. And then they had radiance because they were serious in prayer. You saw that when it says he sought the Lord, verse 4, and he answered him. Verse 6, this poor man called out and the Lord heard him and he saved him out of his troubles. If we're serious in prayer, God produces a radiance in our lives. And then number 3, number 3, look at verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. God protects those who fear Him. God protects those who fear Him. Now some people have used this verse to say we all have a guardian angel. That every one of you has been assigned a guardian angel. I find no evidence of that anywhere in Scripture. But what I do find in Scripture is that the armies of God can be sent out by God at any point to assist the saints. Now what that means is and, and we're about to jump off in it a little bit. We're about, y'all ready? Y'all want to ease off in it a little bit? What that means is that some of you have got to get a more serious understanding and belief and faith in the fact that there is real spiritual warfare. That there are things going on that are unseen in the heavenlies all about us. And that doesn't mean we're supposed to get weird and delve off into trying to have visions and divinations of things. It's just that all the while that things are happening, you may not know what God is doing on your behalf. And sometimes we say things like, I just feel like God isn't doing anything right now. Oh, you're so ignorant. I love you, but you're ignorant. And I'm ignorant. And thank God, because God is moving in ways that are unseen and fighting in ways that are unseen and sending His angels in ways that are unseen for those who love Him and who fear Him. He protects those who fear Him. He sent an angel to Abraham when the knife was upheld and he was about to plunge it into Isaac. He sent an angel to wrestle with Jacob. He sent an angel to inflame the bush. One of my favorite stories of and all the Old Testament is in 2 Kings 6. And Elijah is fighting. And he doesn't think there's any prayer. For he and the Israelite army. And all of a sudden they've been there the whole time. 
But it says that God opens up his eyes and he looks to the hills and he begins to see that the entire camp is surrounded by the angels of God. Friends, God protects those who fear him and he does it in incredible and amazing ways. In his infinite sufficiency in all times and all circumstances, he meets the deepest needs of his children. Now we're going to talk about this in just a second. But when I say he meets the deepest needs of his children, do not hear me say that he gives you everything you want. Thank God he doesn't give me everything that I want. Why? Because I'm not sovereign. So because I'm not sovereign, what I want and what I need may be two totally different. In fact, many times it's been two totally different things. I don't want a God who gives me what I want because I'm fallen and I'm fleshly and I'm sin-filled. And if you just gave me what I wanted, then what I would want may not always be what is best. And so I'm thankful for a God that gives me what I need and a God that doesn't always give me what I want. And then verse 8. What a great verse. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. God allows us to experience him personally. God allows us to experience him personally. Taste and see. He's saying, no by experience. Come and try the Lord and you will like it. As we trust him daily, we experience how good he is. You've heard so many powerful testimonies about what God has done. But what about in your own personal life? Don't be content with the testimony of other people. Don't be content with theoretical knowledge. It says, blessed is the man that trusts in him. Did you see that in verse 8? What is the converse of that? If blessed is the man who trusts in him, what is the converse of the the second part of verse 8? Cursed is the man who doesn't trust in God. And both of those things are true. Blessed is the man who trusts the Lord and who fears Him. And cursed is the man who does not trust in the Lord. When we look at that, it jumps off the page because we're able to see that when we say we trust the Lord, that this trust, this faith, it's not mental assent. It's not just agreeing to a creed, but it's a commitment to a living person for guidance and control of our lives. The gospel cannot be appreciated unless it is experienced. You can't live on borrowed faith. So he's not telling us to argue and understand. He's telling us to taste and see. Now, rightfully so, there has been a large movement against what some people have called experiential Christianity. In other words, it's all about experience. But, let's tell the truth. If you've never experienced the Lord through the power of the gospel, if all it is is you being able to recite some verses or a story, but it's never been real to you, then you've never tasted and seen that the Lord is good. I invited last week, I invited a family to church that was new to the area. And before the conversation, we had a long conversation, and before the conversation was over, the guy actually didn't know I was the preacher at the church, and I try to keep it that way um, for a long time until somebody walked up and ruined it. Um, <laughs> but this is what I told him. I said, look, what I want you to do is, if you'll do, do this favor, I told him what our, ser- our services were. I said, I'd love, I'd love for you to come one Sunday, bring your family. If you and I talk afterwards, you say, that's not for me, it's good. But I want you to come and just experience what God's doing in that, in that place. I've never had anyone try Jesus and say, that's not for me. Not if they met the real Jesus. Not if they met the biblical Jesus. Not if they met the Christ who died for me. Not if they met the one who is risen. Not if they met the one who is delivered and redeemed. You can't try that Jesus and say, oh, I wish I hadn't tried that. No. 
Because you come and you taste and see that the Lord is good. And when you do that, our last point today is that God meets our deepest need. Look at verse 9. Fear the Lord, you His saints, for those who fear Him lack nothing. The lions grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Again, this is not a promise that we'll have all we want, but a praise that God supplies our needs in unexpected ways. We know that some may suffer mightily. David suffered mightily. But to have God is to really have all you need because He is enough. That we would believe that He is enough for salvation. That we would believe that God is enough. And sometimes in the Western world, there are so many crutches that we have on our lives that very often we are not forced into a place where we have to see that God is all we need because we prop ourselves up by so many different things. But most of you, most of you, those of you that are believers, many of you have had multiple incidences. But almost all of you in here at least have one incident that you've looked back on your life and you can remember it like it was yesterday. You probably can remember the way the room felt. You probably can remember where you were You can probably remember how broken it was. And I don't know that your prayer sounded exactly like this. But there's been many a time where a lot of you in here have bowed your head and said, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. God, I'm not going to make it. I I can't do it. This is more than I can take. I'm overwhelmed. And if you don't do something... I'm not coming out of this. Some of you have been in health places, marriage places, financial places, spiritual places, sin, addiction. You've been in places where you have found yourself and you said, you know what, the only person that's going to do anything for me in this is the Lord. And it's not that I don't appreciate people or love people, but I don't know a person that can get me out of this. And some of you right now, even as you think about it, because I can look into your eyes, and right now you're remembering that moment, and you're remembering what it felt like. But just because you can remember that moment means also that a lot of the same ones of you who are thinking about that moment could jump to your feet right now, and you could say, but let me tell you, He's always been enough, and let me tell you what He did, and let me tell you how He showed up, and let me tell you how He sustained, and let me tell you how He delivered. And if you want to know, just sit down, because I want to tell you to taste and see that the Lord has been good to me. He didn't always do what I wanted, but He's always done what I needed. And let me tell you, He's given me the greatest gift that I could have ever possibly hoped to experience. And that is that I was lost in my sin, going drifting far from the Lord, sinking like a ship at sea. And He reached down with His salvific, grace-filled hand and He picked me up out of that pit and He set me on a place of salvation. And I now stand as one who is forgiven and redeemed. Instead of being scared of, to death of the grave, I now stand being able to say victory in Jesus, my Savior forever, who sought me and fought me with His redeeming love. That's my testimony. That should be your testimony as well. So if you've ever tasted and seen that the Lord is good, then this invitation ought to be a time for you to say, Oh God, I bow before you to say thank you, thank you, thank you. I will praise your name at all times. I will extol your name. Come magnify the Lord with me. Could we do that together? If you've never been delivered, if you've never been saved, this offer of salvation is for you. God can do for you today what He has done in the past for others. He can save you today and redeem you today and deliver you today. You can be saved today. Come taste and see that the Lord is good. Try Jesus. Some of you have tried so much other garbage. You've tried so much sin. You've run to so many other things. Try Jesus. Maybe you're listening today and you know that everything else has disappointed you and the reason it's disappointed you is it's bound to disappoint. It's empty and it's hollow. But the eternal and everlasting God says you can be saved. Run to salvation. Maybe it is that you're here today and you need a church family to magnify the Lord with. 
I couldn't imagine magnifying the Lord with another group of people. I love this place. Would you come magnify the Lord with me? Would you be a part of what God's doing here? Or maybe it is today that you just stand in just a moment and you say, you know what? Despite everything going on in the country, despite gas prices and political issues and all the things that I'm walking through right now, I want to tell you that I've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And I'm going to praise Him and I'm going to bow before Him and I'm going to say, thank you, Jesus. I'm going to brag on the God of my salvation for the redeemed today. That's your invitation. Would you stand with me?